Welcome. This is Alexia Hudson Ward, editor in chief of Toward Inclusive Excellence, or TIE for short, a multimedia blog hosted by Choice, a publishing unit of the Association of College and Research Libraries, a division of the American Library Association. We explore issues of equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility that affect the higher education community. Among the goals of this channel is to develop a pool of knowledge and actionable resources for information professionals, undergraduates, faculty of all disciplines, campus staff, and administrators at every level seeking to understand racism from new perspectives and to promote social justice on their campuses. We are excited to welcome you to our podcast series that borrows its name from the Higher Education Academic Calendar. Therefore, you are listening to Ty's Fall Semester Podcast. Our first Fall Semester Podcast features an insightful interview with Dr. Devarian L. Baldwin, author of the critically acclaimed book, In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower, How Universities Are Plundering Our Cities. In this work, Dr. Baldwin alludes to an ever-growing and complicated circumstance in which many city residents are deeply impacted by the entangled relationship between urban life and higher education. Dr. Baldwin outlines how cities are complicit in encouraging the creation of what he describes as universities to address the so-called right flight by encouraging the highly educated and compensated creative and technological classes to remain in cities in exchange for cultural and social engagement with higher education institutions. According to Dr. Baldwin, the complications of this desire by cities to attract and retain this new creative class has resulted in gentrification and housing displacement, labor issues, over-policing, and surveillance that largely impacts BIPOC communities. Dr. Baldwin is the Paul E. Rayther Distinguished Professor of American Studies and the founding director of Smart Cities Lab at Trinity College in Connecticut. He holds a bachelor's degree from Marquette University and a master's and PhD in American Studies from New York University. He is also the author of Chicago's New Negroes, Modern Tea, The Great Migration, and Black Urban Life, and co-editor with Mika Michelani of the essay collection Escape from New York, The New Negro Renaissance Beyond Harlem. He has received grants and fellowships from Harvard University, the University of Virginia, the University of Notre Dame, and the Logan Nonfiction Writing Fellowship from the Cary Institute for the Global Good. Now, on to our conversation with Dr. Devarian L. Baldwin. Devarian, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Your book is amazing. Um, and I'm thrilled to be able to have this conversation with you. So we are really, really appreciate it. It's a pleasure and it's to be interesting. here. Sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, no, it's totally, it's all good. <laughs> We're always happy when our interviewees are excited as we are to engage with them. Uh, the title of your book alludes to like an ever-growing and complicated circumstance in which many city residents live in the quote-unquote shadows of the ivory towers. So would you share with our listeners some of the impacts you've studied of the, as you described it, the entangled relationship between urban life and higher education? Thanks so much for that question. Um, as you pointed out, yes, uh, I think we, we live with this reality um, kind of like all around us in the, in, in the air, but we don't always have the opportunity or the privilege to spend time like a researcher to just stop and assess and, and, and uh, analyze the situation. Because most of us know that right before our eyes, uh, schools, colleges and universities have become the biggest real estate owners, low-wage employers, 
healthcare providers, and policing agents in mm. major cities and towns all across the country. In short, as I say, colleges and universities have become today's factories, and our communities have become their factory towns. But with that dynamic, there is a cost to those who, as you point out, those who live in the shadows of the ivory towers. So the book begins with this opening story where I'm in a library on Chicago's South Side, and I come out and there's a protest uh, because uh, residents from the historically black neighborhood of Brownsville to the north of the um, Hyde Park campus at the University of Chicago are protesting. They're charging, cu- charging cultural theft and piracy. And I'm wondering, what's going mm. on? What, what's happening here? And as I do the research that we all do as scholars, I, I start asking questions and try to figure out what was going on. And they were upset and they were and there were signs that said, you know, U of C, look at your history and save the checkerboard lounge. And I came to find out that the historic black uh, blues club known as the checkerboard lounge um, was struggling. Uh, and the university came in in the name of historic black preservation, saving black history. And they purchased the lounge, picked it up and moved it to the commercial corridor of Harper Court within the Hyde Park campus neighborhood. So this is the reason why Mm -hmm. uh, uh, students and residents and activists were charging cultural theft, that in the name of preserving Black history, Mm -hmm. you're taking Black history and creating and using it to create this kind of commercial anchor to draw tourists and students to the Hyde Park College campus to buy, to shop, to live, to consume And this was my entree into this larger conversation about this growing impact and control that colleges and universities are having over our communities. At the center of this story is the notion or the reality that colleges and universities are designated as 501c3 nonprofits because Mm -hmm, of the public mm -hmm. good that they provide through the form of education. Now, they have been nonprofits for decades, but in today's um, uh, kind of deindustrial economy, a, a world without, a, a, an area without factories. To what degree have universities become, again, the factories in our communities? And so with all of this land that is nonprofit, how do partnerships with universities become tax shelters for both the university and private industry, private partners, And a perfect example of this was the historically black neighborhood of Witherspoon Jackson. Um, They realized that their property taxes were going up, but their amenities were not. So the public works, the, Mm -hmm. you know, were not being improved. And they wondered why. And then they realized that it was because they sat next to these glorious islands of glass and steel known as uh, buildings on the Princeton University campus. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. The, the, so their property taxes were going up, but there have been no improvements in the infrastructure of the neighborhoods in New Jersey in this with the Spoon Jackson neighborhood because they realized that these buildings were housing multi-million dollar contracts with the pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly. And mm-hmm. so there were partnerships mm-hmm. between Eli Lilly and Princeton to produce research that was then being sold on the market to Eli Lilly. And coming back to the university in millions of dollars of royalties for that research. So the campus was hoarding millions of dollars on nonprofit land while the surrounding neighborhoods were not doing well or they were not be, they were not uh, benefiting from improvements. And yet their property taxes were going up. And I mm. began to spin out this story and found out this is not just a, a, a New Jersey story, but in, and it's not just a private school Ivy League story, but even in a state school like Arizona State University where the, the, it's a public university almost only in name, which is a trend across the country because uh, we're finding that public schools are only received now between a 12 and 20% of their op- operating budgets from uh, mm-hmm. state expenditures. So these schools have had to find ways to become more entrepreneurial. So a way to do this is, is begin to figure out how to monetize this tax-exempt land. So mm. to this day, Arizona State University houses the largest private development in the state of Arizona, a uh, a regional headquarters for state farm insurance. And the reason why they do that is because they pass on the tax exemption to this private company. And then in exchange for that, that tax exemption for the private company, that company, State Farm, passes on a slightly lower rate to the university. 
Mm-hmm. So now mm-hmm. the university can take that money and do things like buy, uh, build a, foot, a, multi, a state-of-the-art uh, football stadium or pay former NFL New York Jets head coach Herm Edwards an nfl size salary to run their football program because this money that comes from this tax exemption, um, this, this slightly lower payout from the private company, is exempt or is, is uh, transferred to the university without state oversight. Mm, mm-hmm, Another mm-hmm. example, I just got a call a few weeks ago from Congress, uh, uh, um, uh, a council person in the inner ring suburb of St. Louis by the name of University City. They were realizing that more and more of their properties were being removed from the tax rolls. And so their, bu- their operating budget was getting smaller and smaller. Why? Because Washington University in St. Louis was coming into their community, buying up single family homes, Mm. turning them into what we call mini dorms, which means that instead of it being for a single family, they are cutting it up into individual units for students who can pay higher rates. And then that property, because it's being used as a dormitory space, is being taken off the property rolls. Mm. And so that is taking money from the budget of the town. So that's just land. Mm-hmm. We can also talk about labor. We can talk about policing. I mean, there are so many areas of, of impact that these schools are having that on their surface seem to be a public good, but they primarily serve the either private interests or the self-interest of the university institutions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. And we're definitely going to get into some of these other topics that you've raised. This is a uh also been an issue of interest for me as being a first-generation college graduate, born and raised in inner city Philadelphia, right. and you know seeing so much uh, landscape transformation at the hands of many of the colleges and universities within the greater Philadelphia region. So, and now also being in greater Boston and seeing yep. some of those oh, yeah. also, you know, landscape transitions, New York, as you had identified, Chicago, the Midwest, you know, the Southwest, the far west in terms of the west coast it's a fascinating it's really fascinating and and within your book you introduced me to a lot of nomenclature so i'm going to do okay. my best to make sure that i pronounce this particular term sure. correctly but you coined the term universities mm-hmm. to describe an urban planning model and and this is something that i found really intriguing um, that is celebrated and encouraged by municipalities all over the country to address so-called right flight. You know, we've heard of white flight, right? Um, but I'm not sure that many of our listeners, and it definitely wasn't a term that I was familiar with, right flight. Um, and so would you please discuss what is meant by bright Light, yes. And how colleges and universities are viewed as like economic levers to address this concern by some city leaders. It's really interesting. Yeah, you raise a great point. So right now, everybody wants a campus. If you've been to New York City, um, Cornell Tech was just created not just just two years ago on one of the main islands um, in New York City. Uh, Mesa, yes. Ar- Mesa, Arizona built a um, ASU satellite campus. Um, This is a phenomenon that's going on all over the country where people look to building a university as what they call an economic driver or a anchor to solidify the economy in a a, a nation or a world without factories. That how can the university serve as a facilitator of capital and labor Mm. around tech, pharmaceuticals, um, uh, retail, uh, housing, um, and not just students, but also extended housing beyond that for young professionals and others. So this, this, this story of the university, as you pointed out, it has a, sh- a history that's short and long. And so just taking mm. back a little bit, the, the, the children of suburban sprawl, um, young professionals and empty nesters began powering what was called at the time a back to the city movement in the 1990s. So some young people on the, on the on, you know, listening might, that's ancient. For me, that's, that's very recent history. But, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. That was like last week for me. Right. So I, I hear you. <laughs> exactly. And so this back to the city movement 
was largely supported by city leaders advertising shorter commutes and offering public subsidies to underwrite higher paying tech and design startups in old warehouses um, while clearing out the poor from prime real estate with ruthless eviction and policing tactics like uh, New York's former New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani's uh, quality of life campaign. And there were there were variations on this all over the country um, rooted in what we call broken windows policies around policing. Um, yes. So, so mm-hmm. on, on one hand, city leaders were um, competing with each other to build an urban world as people were coming back into the cities to attract the density and tax base that came with these new residents. So they were trying to prevent what we could call bright flight, the what Richard Florida calls the creative class of professors and tech workers and uh, digital designers and, and advertising agency workers and all the, the whole host of, of, of creative workers that were coming to the city, white collar professionals that were coming to the city. And it, it was a very kind of uh, heavy handed and, you, you know, just on the nose and, and improper use of the term bright flight, which kind of signals back to the notion of white flight uh, during the suburban era. And, and, it, and it builds on that because most of these white collar workers that they're trying to bring back into the city to save the city were not just white collar, but also white. The, the grandchildren right. of suburbanites were coming back in the city. And so this bright flight point, it had a ex- profoundly racial undertone to it. Um, yeah. And so various cities are trying to compete with each other to bring these uh, returnees or recent graduates to stay in the city and help build it up. And it was precisely the commercial amenities associated with university life, concerts, coffee shops, foot traffic congestion, uh, fully wired networking. These were the things that were marketed as a desirable urban experience, kind of a suburbanized version of the city. Libraries, museums, yes. right? Like you can have access to these Water, things. Waterfront not... commercial development. Yes. Um, all these, yes. you know, um, uh, Faneuil Hall in Boston, South Street Seaport in New York City. Uh, right. The list goes on and on, right? Na- the Navy Yards in uh, Chicago. Uh, these were all beginning to develop in this moment, kind of suburbanized ideas about urban life. And so, and with it, but also these were these were also ideas about the campus as the as the vision of the urban life. And so, with the decline in manufacturing, it was said that the the quote unquote bell towers of higher education were seen as the new smokestacks. Um, the mm. signals of a potentially thriving economy. This was happening just at the same time that colleges and universities faced shrinking state contributions for higher education uh, support um, alongside this greater competition for top students and researchers who would do knowledge work in the cities. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so by extending their footprint into surrounding neighborhoods, schools began to engage in land ownership for-profit research, low-wage employment, not faculty, low-wage employment, service work, and policing as a way to generate new sources of revenue by providing the urban amenities and protection to to, to, to attract students, researchers, their families, young professionals, all to come back into the city. So in this moment of the 90s and 2000s, the interests of city leaders and university administrators converged. They came Mm. together in this belief that uh, the campus as a planning design could become a lucrative model for urban revitalization, right? Mm -hmm. If you build out the campus or you build out a campus light environment, even like Amazon and Google, their their properties are called what? A campus. A campus, right. This this mixture of retail and nightlife and housing um, and workshops on these lands become a way to capture um, what we call wealth capture, to bring in all these workers and their families to spend, to work, and to stay. Whereas before, they might leave at sundown coming into the city. So so in the last two decades, colleges and universities have witnessed an explosive rise in the Mm -hmm. salaries for a growing administrative class, or not faculty, but administrative class running divisions tasked with accelerating this campus expansion we're talking about. So whether it's the real estate department on campus, the university foundation, uh, campus security, the development office, office of technology transfer, 
Uh, these all have been beefed up units. So as as we found a contraction or a compression in faculty growth, we've seen an explosive, powerful growth in these non-educational divisions because their job is to turn this campus planning model into a pathway for prosperity for both the university and the city. Mm-hmm. So, so at the center of this story is this notion of the knowledge economy. This is something I just want to take a minute to under to help us understand. Yeah, please. Absolutely. And mm-hmm. so here in the knowledge economy, we're talking about at the time where, you know, industrialized factories have moved to the global south. So it, we, people, some people use the word post-industrialization. That doesn't, there's factories somewhere. We wouldn't right. have our Nike and our Lululemons That's or right. whatever. So, so we're talking about deindustrialization in global northern locales. Right. Like American That's cities. That's right. So in this new knowledge economy that took its place, which is central, is the central driving economic force in uh, North America, you have government-funded academic research. So, so publicly, pub- publicly funded government research, ac- I mean, publicly funded academic research is used to create profitable commercial goods or patents in a range of fields from pharmaceutical industries and software products to health services and military defense weaponry. And all of this work, where does it sit? Where are those workshops to do that research that will be generated or converted into patents? All these workshops sit on campuses, these non, these tax exempt campuses. So today's urban universities and colleges have powered ahead by creating these things that we call innovation districts or knowledge communities. So, for example, right. Wexford right. Science and Technology, a, a development corporation, they only work on developments that are based on partnerships between private science and tech industries situated on university campuses. So their developments include U City Square in Phil- in West Philadelphia, <laughs> uh, and they're building more. <laughs> I've been talking to and activists around more. that. So U City Square yes. in Philadelphia. Cortex in St. Louis. These are just a couple. Mm-hmm. Uh, the biomedical campus in Phoenix and Converge Miami. This also includes what I mentioned earlier, Harper Court in U Chicago on the South Side, uh, the shops at Yale in New Haven, and USC Village in what's now being called South LA, what we grew up knew, knowing as South Central LA. As South Central LA. Right. That's so right. it's been, it's been yep. rebranded as South LA. Um, yeah. Because yep. it's predominantly black and brown and, you know, uh, inhabitants. And so the point here is that under the cover of education and research, these become tax-free zones, these innovation districts and and knowledge communities. These become tax-free zones, and it's on these campuses where academic research and corporate sponsorships meet real estate and retail development wrapped in private security teams to protect all that wealth. And so Mm -hmm. this is really an important formation to understand because these campuses sit, are situated, you mentioned diversity, equity, inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion. These campuses and their extended knowledge communities and innovation districts, they sit largely in communities of color because of historic right. relationships between these urban universities and migration patterns throughout the 20th century. And so when these campuses expand, they're expanding into working class neighborhoods and communities of color. And as these uh, knowledge communities and innovation districts extend out into the city, they are transforming city blocks into tech and university lifestyle profits and zones with largely, largely generated from public dollars that come with a little public benefit and little public oversight. In the case we talked about with ASU, where they're transferring yeah. these public dollars into their private interests, even if they're a public university, their interests are building football stadiums and uh, uh, hotels and uh, rock climbing walls and, and lazy rivers for students and high end housing and, and uh, five star dining to attract both students and uh, white collar professionals into these campus zones. A lot of this is being done with public money because of their nonprofit status. That becomes a a, a gateway or a mechanism to transfer um, what would normally be taxes into their interests. 
Um, what would normally be, uh, you know, uh, uh, living wages get suppressed on these in these areas because graduate students are called apprentices. Um, many right. cases, they're not allowed to collectively organize. And we've seen the last year a, a powerful strike wave of graduate students fighting against this. Um, at the same time, um, these schools, to protect all this wealth, they have beefed up public safety in the form of pu- full-on police departments, not not just, you know, patrol cars or patrol units, uh, the, the sleepy, you know, uh, security guard that walks the halls. We're talking about fully developed police departments with certified capacity to carry weapons and have a, a arrest and detainment jurisdiction power beyond the main campus. Yeah. And, yeah. and if they're private universities, because private institutions in America are exempt from Freedom of Information Act laws, they can police and arrest and are n- not required to report their activities to any public. So they have public mm. authority with very little public oversight, not just on campuses, which is bad enough, but in non-campus residential areas throughout our cities in the name of increased public safety, but they police in clear ways that are driven by protecting the interests of the institution and the wealth that is being hoarded and contained on these campus blocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that, so then when we talk about DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, and it, it largely gets contained in terms of diversifying uh, the faculty, um, diversifying the curriculum, diversifying the student body, um, so courses and students in classrooms. But we look at this expansive role that universities and colleges are playing in our everyday life. That racial reckoning, that notion of diversity, equity, inclusion must extend far beyond the campus gates to talk about the ways in which universities create or uh, uh, exacerbate racial disparity, especially between predominantly white institutions that sit in largely black and brown communities where they extract wealth through tax exemption, through their policing practices, through their um, their limitations on living wages. Because let's also be clear, college and universities are the biggest em- low-wage employers in these cities and towns. And who are the primary workers on these campuses? the black and brown residents in the surrounding communities. So when a campus suppresses or fights against creating a living wage or fights against a a collective or collective bargaining on the part of low wage workers, they're not just doing that to their own workers, but they're because they're the biggest employers in cities and towns, they're setting the wage ceiling for the entire city at the low wage level. Because if they are required to pay a higher wage, no other entities in the city will have to compete because they are the biggest employer, the colleges and universities. So if they mm-hmm. set a living wage, then all the other industries or employers in the city will have to match that in order to maintain their employees. So when we talk about DEI, we have to talk about all these things, the ways in which these universities are the biggest healthcare providers. Right, and right. And instead right. of, of and, and by by mandate of their tax exemption, the health care pro, uh, provide provisions, they're supposed to provide indigent, indigent, indigent care to the surrounding communities. Many of them do not, or they make it extremely difficult to understand what resources are made available. Instead, we've seen hospital centers like Johns Hopkins or Yale New Haven Hospital um, pursue liens on black and brown people's homes. And because mm. a lot of these black and brown folks work at the university, they garnish their checks for these healthcare services, where in fact many of these same uh, 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 workers who are getting healthcare provisions probably could be eligible for indigent care subsidies, but they don't even mm. know it. So when we talk about DEI, we have to talk about all these things. Right, right. Now you raised so many, <laughs> so many excellent and interesting points, and specifically around you know, some of the signaling that many colleges and universities have done in the in the broader diversity space, right. right? Particularly after the murder of George Floyd, you started to see these statements, you started to see movement towards um, re-examining some institutional practices like procurement, mm-hmm. more of a push to diversify the professorate, uh, staff, you know, students. 
you know, yet the, the question around good citizenship remains, right? That's right. And and when we contextualize good citizenship, you know, we, we can lean back on this idea, this concept that you raised earlier, um, Tiberian, around how higher education tends to self-promote its presence as contributing to the public good. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But you have um, definitely in this conversation raised the also important pieces around how institutions have rightfully been accused of participating in some negative practices, right? Mm. Gentrification, policing, surveillance, right? And, And how those practices disproportionately impact you know, what we now tend to call BIPOC right. communities, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, how can these circumstances be addressed? You know, because I think as, you know, a longtime person in the academy, longtime administrator in the academy, there is kind of this like verbal tussle, if you will, between faculty and administration on on the matters of equity, generally speaking, yes. right? But but you raised something that I think is equally important, which is the institutional outward expression of values, right, that we all claim to to honor, right? And so how can these complicated topics that you raise in your book so eloquently be addressed? And what role should higher education play? in becoming better citizens within urban communities? Do you see yeah. any glimpses of hope? Yeah, um, so it's, a, it's a phenomenal question. It's a, it's a great way to come to this to this conversation. And real quickly, I just want to raise up the reality that when we talk about these, these uh, university city relationships, and I was speaking a lot about black and brown communities, but the, but the I and BIPOC indigenous is also very relevant here. If we look at a place like Phoenix yes. or Minneapolis, yes. Um, there are urban indigenous communities that are at the crosshairs of these kinds of encroachments and, and um, uh, plunderings that take place on the part of these universities. And a lot of this work is happening in a parallel fashion with, on one hand, the university is doing this kind of uh, expansion, gentrification, encroachment work, while also doing land acknowledgments before every event and putting <laughs> up in, uh, slave memorials on their main campus. Yes. And putting up Black Lives Matter motifs across their websites. And so there must be some ways to bring these two worlds together in a robust and generative way. And so this is where it leads me to answer your question more directly. And this is kind of the work that I've been doing with my Smart Cities Lab that's come out of um, this book and this research. And, and the point here is that, first of all, higher education is pervasive in our lives in ways that we don't really expl- ex- you know, don't always confront. So they, it's so true. Right. They, they, <laughs> they've become the shop floor of all workers. They've become the land baron over all residents. Not just this is not just an ivory tower phenomena. And they've become the political boss over city budgets. I had one gentleman in Hyde Park say that when any developer comes into the high, to the south side of Chicago f- to build, the first place they go is to the administration building at U Chicago to get approval. <laughs> this is a private entity dictating democratic practices. So the point I'm making here is that they are pervasive in all these ways. And so therefore, if the university is so all encompassing, then there is much, therefore, that can be done to help, help and help these institutions live up to their public good expressions and mandates. And it's important, as, as you pointed out, and to point out again, is that this public good expression does a lot of work. It's not just public relations. It also does financial work. It, be, it becomes a form of, of, of tax exemption in the, on the tax code. Like it becomes a financial measure as well or mechanism. And so this, this public good thing is real. Um, it becomes a way for 40 and $50 billion endowments to also remain tax exempt. Uh, so, so it's important to understand this from a, mater- from a materialist perspective. And so yes. with this in mind, you know, collectively, we can call on schools to enact reparations for the degree to which slave labor, indigenous land seizures, uh, Jim Crow practices, and urban renewal practices all underwrote the building out of these institutions. Yes, reparations. But we can also call for what have been called pilots or payments in lieu of taxes. Um, and in, in to compensate for the ways in which the money that's supposed to go to public services is going onto these campuses. 
um, we can call on schools to reserve a portion of their tax exempt endowments for community development projects. Uh, we can call on schools to attach a community benefits agreement to any campus expansion project that can include things like affordable housing mandates, zip code specific right, jobs, right. job training, procurement contracts with small businesses in zip code areas, scholarships, and access to guaranteed access to campus facilities, which is something that I saw in, in at the University of Winnipeg in Canada. And we can talk about that more in mm. a minute. Um, we watch schools throw away food daily because of health codes. And we can demand, though, that they can instead, this is, this is low-hanging fruit, they can package this food into healthy meals for communities of need. And when I mm -hmm. mentioned this to medical students at, at UPenn, they are instituting a pilot program of in this very nature in the fall. So anybody out there who might be of means because they need they need um, massive industrial refrigerators to hold this food. If you want us to contribute to that campaign with the UPenn medical students, please provide your support to that work. I think it, and again, this is low hanging fruit because this is work. This is food that's being thrown away daily. And so, you know, mm -hmm. just what are you saying to your surrounding communities of need when you do that? And you could easily package it into healthy meals. Some of this was done during the pandemic, but why is it done all the time? Um, at the same time, we we watch and we assess the failure of campus police to address the primarily white um, campus crimes of sexual assault and substance abuse while they over police the black and brown neighborhoods surrounding the campus. So crime runs rampant on these campuses and it directly impacts not just students of color, but also significantly white women. So mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. watch police campus police jurisdictions extend into surrounding communities by engaging in racial profiling. And what's being called a two-tier policing system, where uh, a student and a resident commit the same infraction, the student goes to see the dean of students, and the resident goes to the criminal justice system. So, so we right. see these racially disparate dynamics, and we realize that campus policing fails on all accounts. It doesn't solve crime on campus because it doesn't want to undermine its own brand, and it over-polices surrounding communities to great failure. And so, therefore, we call on the abolition of campus police to be replaced with to be replaced with teams of preventative outreach and trauma mm -hmm. care mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. housing security and food security, things that actually serve public safety needs that have been proven to reduce crime, have been proven to meet the needs of public safety, both for surrounding communities and for students on campus. So these are things that we call for in, in the conversations that I've had with community groups. And this book is built on over 100 interviews with a yeah, range of people yes. from all over the country. So those resolutions come from these conversations. And this is what drove the building out of what I have called my Smart Cities Research Lab um, that came really of age after the Black Spring of summer 2020, um, after the killing, mm. as you mentioned, of George Floyd. And it started out that the intent was to be primarily a, a, a information clearinghouse for researchers and scholars. But when this book came out, I started getting phone calls from activists and community groups saying, we read your book and we see ourselves in it. And, and advocacy, I mean, uh, information is not enough. We, we need your advocacy. We need you to come to our communities and help us. And, and so in this past year, it hasn't even been a full year yet. I've been to Berkeley, California, Miami, Florida, New Haven, Connecticut, St. Louis. New York City, amongst other places, doing the work, mm -hmm. working with communities to figure out Philadelphia, West, uh, uh, West Philly, in the shadows of Drexel and UPenn um, with the Black Bottom Tribe, showing and figuring out strategies to create more equitable relationships between uh, the cities, their campuses, and the communities that struggle in their shadows. And so, for example, with New Haven Rising, in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Um, I helped mm -hmm. them on a, on a campaign called Yale Pay Your Fair Share. And this resulted in an additional voluntary contribution of tax money um, from the University of Yale. They already pay 14 million a year, but that's on a 40 billion with a B, billion dollar endowment. But through our campaign, we were able to get them to um, contribute an additional $10 million a year over the next six years. Wow. So that's an important uh, victory. Um, I've also, with the lab, we've been working with uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island, We're working with students 
residents and legislatures to pass bills that Mm -hmm. would limit university tax exemptions. In Philadelphia, in a campaign right now, uh, the UC townhomes, which is one of the last few vestiges of affordable housing in West Philadelphia, is being um, uh, dem- is, is proposed to be uh, sold, and those uh, working class residents are proposed to be evicted. There are protests right now, today, happening, and we're fighting to make sure that uh, low income housing is preserved in the university city area where the um, universities and cities have colluded to create prosperity for tech workers, pharmaceutical companies that want to partner with universities at the detriment of the residents that are trying to hold on for dear life and benefit from the prosperity going on with these partnerships. Um, In Miami, we're advocating for community use of campus buildings that was promised to community groups when these developments were built in their neighborhoods in Little Haiti, in Overtown, Alapata. Um, We're workshopping with the National Clinician Scholars Program to ensure that university hospitals honor their indigent care mandates in exchange for their tax exemptions. And we're also engaging in wall-to-wall organizing through the lab with the American Association of University Professors to ensure Mm. that all campus workers are guaranteed living wages and equitable conditions and benefits all the way at the top with the faculty, all the way down to the service staff, which includes cafeteria workers, grounds crew, uh, support staff, med tech, et cetera. And so these are the kinds of things at the lab that we're saying, okay, what is the political and economic infrastructure of these institutions? How does wealth and dollars move from communities to these campuses? And how can we reverse the trend? How can we, mm-hmm. we, can, we can develop more uh, 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 equitable distribution practices that allow the universities to thrive, but not on the backs of their host communities? And so this series of recommendations and campaigns and these ranges of advocacy are attempts to clearly and soberly assess the kind of uh, the, the social footprint of these institutions and figure out ways to allow these institutions um, to be good neighbors Mm -hmm. in their communities that benefit both the university and the residents that live in their shadows. And this has been some of the most, I can say in, in my 20 plus years of being in the academy, this is the most gratifying, um, uh, uh, generative, thriving kind of work I could ever be doing. We, we all talk about and we love to think about the ways in which our work can be a service to the larger world. Universities, they tout That's themselves right. as solving the world's most difficult problems. And yet it's, it's, it's interesting that they don't look at the problems that they might have a hand in creating in their own backyard. And so this is, for me, this is doing that work. This is out there in the community. And so when, when I wrote this book and I started getting calls from community groups, some people who had been incarcerated with only, and who only have a sixth or eighth grade education, but they were able to read this book. And they said, I see myself in this work. And, and, and the things you're talking about, I, they, they're in my backyard. I live them every day, but you, you've named them, you framed them. And, and now I'm motivated to act and build and think differently and, and, and create a different urban future. Um, I couldn't ask for a better outcome for the work that, I, that I've been trying to do, for the research, for the work. So this, is, this has been amazing. And I, and I thank you for having given me the opportunity to explain um, what's been going on. Absolutely, Deveria. And this is, I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> I really could. This has been a phenomenal conversation. And thank you. Thank you so much for your time. You give us so much food for thought, but you've also left us with some hope around the ways in which we can partner with various institutions around the nation to really live up to the mantra of serving for the public good and to really do the important introspection around the ways in which DEI measures should hold us all accountable to being better citizens within our respective communities. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say at the end, like, you know, people sometimes look at this work and see it as being anti-university, but it's, as you pointed out, it is about seeing the university, seeing the claims of the institutions and making, enforcing, hoping that the institution will live up to its claims. It's about making another university. And, and, and I believe that with an equitable, justice-oriented framework, that is certainly possible. So thank you. 
Absolutely. You're welcome. And thank you. Thank you for listening to our Toward Inclusive Excellence Fall Semester Podcast with Dr. Devarian L. Baldwin, author of In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower, How Universities Are Plundering Our Cities. Sign up for reminders of new content releases and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you so much for your time and support. Be well.